welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a returning good brother to the temple. Contrary to popular belief, his tabletop me methods have not been passed down to the Armstrong line for generations. <laughs> but he is the he is the man behind CRISPR Monker, Monkey Studios, and responsible for Gene Funk 2090, which we've covered in the past with the back when we he, back when he was doing the Shadows of Korea expansion. Now I'm back again for the dark for the Dark Forest expansion. The one, eh, the one and only James Armstrong, and I had to get I had to get that Full Metal Alchemist joke in there in there because I didn't do it last time. <laughs> you know, I uh, I was teaching English in South Korea when that show was at its height, and every single one of my coach teachers they were all known by their first names because uh, they were going for a casual vibe, but. I was called Armstrong teacher purely because of that show. Everybody, <laughs> everybody wanted to say it all the time. I was, I would be very disappointed if so, if um, if nobody had mentioned this teaching style has been passed down through the Armstrong line for generations. <laughs> yeah, for sure. That was yeah, that was regularly uh, the joke for among the students there. They loved calling you Armstrong teacher. <laughs> the you. Usually, I just have pe usually I just have people calling me calling me um, calling me Frost Giant. <laughs> uh, yeah, the second setting book, Dark mm -hmm. Forest. It's uh, yep. up on Kickstarter right now. Yeah, it is up on Kickstarter right now. It's got 16 days to go at the time of this recording, and hang on, I and hang on, I have to do the conversion because of the because of currency difference. You are shooting for twenty thousand Canadian. It is currently at twenty six point four thousand at the time of this recording. Uh, I just had to hover mm -hmm. over it for a second because when I look at it, it's gonna it's obviously gonna show U.S. dollars because I'm. St oh yeah. Even though it's been a while, I'm still stuck in Minnesota. Well, <laughs> yeah, willingly. Well, similar in Minnesota. climate to where I'm at. Mm -hmm. Also means that ev that everybody. Who everybody I know I know in the UK and and Europe looks at looks at the forecast that we get and and looks at us like we're crazy. Absolutely, and that's where uh, you don't have to worry about conversions to Fahrenheit to Celsius for a good month of the year because they're pretty much the same. <laughs> uh, the when it gets that when it gets that low, the approach I've taken is when once you get past the below zero mark, does it really matter? Yeah. Oh. Uh, it's, yep. why, it's why I had. It's why I had, until until it went offline for a while. I had an app called the fucking weather. Yeah. Which instead of giving you the temperature, it just said it's fucking Arctic. Mm -hmm. Or or some or similar things. <laughs> Be and um, I I I will make that joke because well, you're I was stu I was. I was stuck during. I remember that polar vortex and how it was so bad that nobody was leaving the house. Oh yeah, yeah. That's the kind of temperature where it burns your skin to be outside. Taking out the trash is a real, uh, real endeavor every week. <laughs> well, so it was. I I remember hearing stories after the fact that they were setting the train tracks on fire to keep the frost from getting on it too much. <laughs> that makes sense. Checks out. So. But speaking speaking of natural horrors, dark for now was dark force an idea that you that you guys had from from the early onset? Just just other things took bigger priorities, or was no. it a different origin story? No, it, uh, it actually was one of the stretch goals for the very first Kickstarter I had for the core rulebook. And in a way, I'm glad that I didn't get that stretch goal because it, the colossal amount of work that. Uh, it has taken to produce this. <laughs> I'm glad that I didn't have to give that out really as a stretch goal. So it's its own project. It's a over a 200 page book, probably 210, 220 when it's finally done. But uh, yeah, the idea of it was from way back when the core rule book came out, uh, because this, though there are huge amounts of cyberpunk in this setting, it's also biopunk. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, a fair amount of that can get done in a city setting. So like in Shadows of Korea, there was a lot of, because we know where there's research centers, you can do a lot with um, the genomes that are produced and the organisms that are produced Mm -hmm. in an urban setting. But I haven't gotten around until this book producing something where you can really dig in deep to the biopunk and body horror and taking cues from things like Skull Island or the Annihilation movie mm-hmm. or or Jurassic Park and showcasing some of the the kaiju and enormous horrors that just wouldn't make sense in an urban setting cuz they would be put down. Yeah. <laughs> but in a in a cryptic hidden Peruvian jungle valley, you can have those things roaming the forest and nobody's the wiser. So let me get this let me get this out of my system. First off, um, I can see why you'd say it'd be a good. It's a good thing that you didn't hit that stretch goal because the core book alone was is 314 pages, and putting more workload onto that would have probably driven you more insane than normal. Right, I underestimated how big a, this is going to be for sure. Mm-hmm. I was thinking more like a 50 page supplement, but yeah, now it's two two ten or more. Eyes bigger than your stomach. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I can I can certainly get that. Now, the uh, the obvious thing I need to get on my system is how many times has somebody in in the in the office brought up Jurassic Park? <laughs> yeah, for sure. That is definitely one of the touchstones, the cultural touchstones for this the setting book. Uh, the other ones, of course, are Indiana Jones, and the more recent one, they're more obscure, but yeah, the things like color out of space or annihilation where Mm -hmm. it's not just a jungle adventure. It's a biopunk jungle adventure. So yeah, there will be body horror. There will be retroviruses that can warp and transmute flesh and DNA. And there's going to be a lot of, uh, a lot of, of biological monstrosities in this jungle. The re there's Gentoro Gentero Corporation has set up shop in here specifically so that they can do their rankest experiments outside of prying eyes. And uh, everything that roams the jungle are uh, either successful or, or escaped unsuccessful experiments. Mm-hmm. And this might be a bit obvious, but since you're dealing with a jungle, a jungle area that wants to kill you, well, once again, mm-hmm. Australia. Yeah, yeah, Australia is also a good thing to take a cue from. While it's really dangerous for the individual, ecologically, it's it's a little bit like a bubble boy. Where, <laughs> but yeah, this the dark, this dark forest is much more like the invasive uh, the the body for invasive species. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, Australia is scary, but they have more to worry about organisms coming in than getting out. <laughs> yeah, but I'm getting. But since since one of the pillars that you mentioned is lucrative and deadly, th- I get the feeling there's an mm-hmm. I- there's the idea of you can get you can get so, you can get some really good paydays in the in the place, oh, yeah. as long as you live enough to payday. Yeah, this is um a mid tier setting, so I'm designing this to segue with my uh, first setting book, Shadows of Kree, which would probably leave the players at around level eight or so in the fifth edition rule set, mm-hmm. and. Here is where things, you know, once you hit level seven, eight, nine, that's when you start approaching. You can really take a punch with your party and get back up. So the GM doesn't have to pull as many punches when it comes to the encounters. And yeah, that's it's it's designed that way. Hmm. Yeah, it is filled with uh, some really deadly encounters, but also the wealth there. So the, the danger is obvious from all of the horrible genetic experiments being done by Gentero Corporation. Mm-hmm. It's filled with all sorts of viruses that will transmit your DNA, make you sick. And the wealth there is because, one, trophy hunters will go there to take down some of these enormous monsters, both because of the materials they can provide and because it's just a point of pride. As soon as and... you mentioned trophy hunters, what immediately came to mind was predators. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no aliens here, but yeah, there there is the human version of the predators, or at least uh, maybe people don't want to go in there themselves. 
but they might want to, you know, pay a team of mercs to go in there. Bring or just gr- some... or just grab some people, throw throw them in there, and and say good and say good luck. We'll see you in a week. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, the, the all of the megafauna, the genetically engineered megafauna in there, are prized by mm-hmm. real rich people who want to bring home a trophy. And then there's also a city project. You might have heard that some of the famous uh, cities in China that are built massively before being populated. Mm-hmm. Well, one such project happened in this jungle valley before the jungle valley took it over shortly after it was getting populated. So there is uh, one in one of these places is a massive bank vault. So somewhere in the jungle, there is an abandoned city, almost like a city ruins now that has been reclaimed by the jungle before it got fully populated. And everyone had to leave all their possessions behind. So that is one of those sources of wealth. Mm hmm. Adding to that Indiana Jones style exploring ancient ruins type adventure, but of yeah, course I... the security systems are still active. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it sounds like it sounds like you were setting this up that um, it's it's advisable to be at least eighth level, if I if I read that correctly. That's right. Yeah, yeah, um, it's around eighth level. Yeah. That that brings up an interesting point because I've. I've been in I've been in some conversations where where there's the about this narrative that people have had for regarding um D&D in general and 5th edition in particular mm-hmm. that the game that um nobody nobody plays high level because because it's boring. Mm-hmm. Um I I dis I disagree I personally disagree about that. I think I there are certainly problems with high level, but it comes more down to support and over and the First party stuff overemphasizing the new player experience. Mm-hmm. Whereas it, I liken it to the Nintendo Wii being great for casuals, and but not doing a good job at at um encouraging those casuals to stick around. Yeah, yeah, I could see that there. There, it is. I think it is true, and it's actually maps onto my own personal experience that it's very rare that I will play a campaign past level fourteen, fifteen. Uh, I think I think only twice in my life I've gone past level fifteen. I've done one to twenty, done done one to seventeen. But uh, yeah, usually around the that level fifteen mark, things do get. I think partially for the reason with Dungeons and Dragons is the ninth level spells are so so game breaking that it almost is like an end game. Like you, there's not much more you can do past level seventeen. <laughs> of course. Before then, though, I think I think up to like fourteen, fifteen, you're still good. Of course, of course, th- this is the reason why I say it's a two fo- it's a twofold problem, because yes, you do have the you do have the issue of ninth level spells. Although, although um, the idea of those high level spells breaking the game is is nothing new. Um, mm-hmm. I have I have ranted many times over the years about the Cowzilla problem from ba- from back in third edition, <laughs> yeah. or Ka- yeah. Godzilla. These days, the problem oh, yeah. is Cowzilla, um, cleric or <laughs> warlock. Yeah. <laughs> Where somebody, the idea with Godzilla was that somebody who's playing cleric or druid, or sometimes mm-hmm. both, that knows what they're doing, not yes. only is an entire party by themselves, but is playing the game on easy mode. Yeah, there's a little bit of that with almost every caster. I'd say by the time you get to level fifteen or so in fifth edition, where it's the caster's vastly outperformed. Which, I think that which is passes. which is why I which um. Is why I keep, which is why my one of my whipping boys has always been when, um, when ca- when when the cast when caster main players try try and argue that martial characters aren't supposed to be powerful. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and or or even funnier the when when some caster mains were complaining about tome of battle stepping onto the toes of casters. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm like. You have spells that render that render entire features of other classes useless. <laughs> it's true. Oh. and one yeah. one would th- one would think that I'm referring to stuff like teleport or wish. No, mm-hmm. I'm referring to knock. <laughs> yeah, knock is it's it's true. Absolutely. I In between pass of the trace and knock and yeah. Yeah, what's the point of having a what's the point of having a thief around when you can just <laughs> when you can just have the Wizard cast knock and by and bypass the lock as it is. 
Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's true. There is some of that stuff for sure. I got I got around it by but with the with the approach that it with the settings that I'd use where knock only works on magical locks. If it's a physical lock, start picking. Yeah, I could see that working, especially if you don't have any. Uh, only if you have a rogue in the group, I, I would definitely put that in there. Well, there, there are some times where where somebody was like, "Well, well we don't we don't have a rogue." That's not my problem. Figure <laughs> you got you're the players. You got to figure out a way. You got to figure out a way in. Surprise me. Yeah. Oh, uh, I just I had the same. I had a similar thing with teleport since teleport I, is probably even more egregious because you can remove whole rules about overland travel pointless. <laughs> yeah, it's true. That is um. That's one of the obstacles that I had to face with uh, making the Dark Forest is that it is a medium to not high, but you know, mid level, mm -hmm. mid level campaign setting. And some of the abilities that players get around, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten are pretty potent. Mm -hmm. So, um, mitigating things like long rest and making you have to expend resources in order to actually get those rests is uh is one of the ways to offset that because it. The moment you can have unmitigated long rests, you get a huge amount of power. You, if you can take a long rest in between every encounter, you're doing fine. So inside the dark forest, these horrible viruses that uh, mutate your flesh and DNA uh, can be only staved off by taking continual drugs based on uh, Komodo dragon, <laughs> Komodo dragon immunity, your innate immune system. Mm -hmm. They're incredibly expensive. So that kind of puts a bit of a fuse, a, a little bit of a timer in terms of financial cost on them uh, not wanting to take a whole ton of long rests because each each long rest they take is very costly in terms of their own uh, resources. The their way you describe resources. it, it reminds me of the um, of the sh the Shadowlands rules in Legend of the Five Rings because okay, the Shadowlands and the Shadowlands and L five R. Um, is de is downstream from a literal hellhole. Mm -hmm. Well, more Jigoku than hell, but you get the point. Yeah. And just being in the, just being in the Shadowlands can taint you. The main way the main way to stave it off is with a finger of jade. Okay. And yeah. Those. It's it's essentially it is essentially a piece of jade that's the size of a man's um, index finger. Yeah. Um. Since jade, it jade is jade is very useful for for both protecting oneself from and fighting the kind of creatures in the shadowlands, where you, you have uh, you have undead, you have you have mm -hmm. oh, you have ogres, and sometimes you can have full on oni in that place mm -hmm. and worse. Yeah. <laughs> and the the thing is though, those fingers. Are not easy. Are not going to be easy to come by, since since the one clan who's tasked with defend defending the empire from the Shadowlands isn't willing to share those kind of things, you know, because mm -hmm. they need them. Mm -hmm. And two, they're only going to last you a week. Right. Yes, it is a similar idea. You're having an expendable resource that, uh, if you want to take a long rest, you might have to sacrifice uh, your choice about getting that next cyberware upgrade because it's so costly. Or mm -hmm. maybe just take the effects of the horrible mutations it does to your DNA. <laughs> your when, choice. When doing a rest in the forest, do you have you put in plans for for say the for say the camp rules, i.e. who's gonna i.e. who's gonna be the lookout, who's ha who's handling supplies and the like? No special rules for uh, for watches and who's handling the supplies, but. Yeah, camping in an area that is not safe is uh, gonna could result in in some very dangerous things happening. There are rare spots in the dark forest that are safe, mm -hmm. and it will involve often making an alliance with a uh, a group that they may not want to. In that reg in that regard, I feel I could invoke the prison settlement in The Walking Dead. It <laughs> it sure it beats the hell out of trying of trying your luck out in the wilderness. But you're only safer in the prison settlement. You're not safe. Yeah, there are a couple of uh, human factions that do exist in the Dark Forest, and they are the progenitors of it, Gentero Corporation, mm -hmm. along with their 
partners, the Sendero Justo, which is a group of narco terrorists that uh, that are running most of the drug exports out of the area. So there's a very special type of uh, drug manufacturing that it can occur with these transgenic plants. So, you know, think of the coca plant, think of all these other horticultural ways to produce pharmaceuticals and take it up to 11. And that's why there's these uh, narco terrorist groups in the dark forest working with the corporation is because they can produce top notch drugs that can't be produced anywhere else and produce so much profit that it's worth the risks. But yeah, they may not be a faction you'd want to uh, get too cozy with. Mm -hmm. Now with with that in mind, there are you mentioned on the Kickstarter that there are six competing factions within the dark, within the dark forest. I'd like to go into just go into the skinny of each of them and the kind of things sure. that they're after, the kind of things that they're after, who they who they like, who they would who the, who they treat as shoot on sight, and who they treat as shoot on sight twice. Right. Okay. So the, I'll go in alphabetical order. The first one is the bigwigs. And they are a group of Quelo Mortos, which are essentially a type of rabbit human hybrid that were produced as prey species in a horrible game of capture the flag, not too unlike the running man. So mm -hmm. their origin is that of a demented person who wanted to create a uh, really entertaining prey species for a televised snuff film type program. So they're, they're rabbit species, but uh, they're very quick, very tough, excellent at avoiding capture from the predators. And at some point, they decided that they didn't want to be the prey anymore. And now they've become bandits who actually ambush Sendero Justo shipments of drugs coming in and out of the forest and make their bones that way. They get a, a lot of the wealth by basically being bandits on all of the massive amount of... Uh, of, of wealth and narcotics trafficking in and out of the dark forest. So those are the big wigs. That's they're a small faction, but they know the forest very well. So they, uh, they're not powerful, but they have some wisdom about they're, they're kind of like Rangers of mm -hmm. the, of the dark forest. Mm -hmm. And if the, if the character, the player characters run across them, they might be able to get some advice on how to survive better, even though they're not, in numbers, powerful. They use hit and run tactics pretty well. Mm -hmm. So that's the first faction. The next faction is Gentera Corporation. They are the ones who actually created the Dark Forest, and it was consciously produced as a way to bypass international laws, national laws, and do the rankest biotech experiments that could be imagined outside of the cover. Or inside of cuff cover, so out away from prying eyes of the rest of the world. The forest itself produces uh, Janus signals, preventing wireless communication. So once you're under the canopy, you can communicate wirelessly as normally. But between above and below, there's uh, no signal. So it's safe from drones and, and spy planes. And nobody knows uh, where these facilities are. But yeah, they, they produce... The jungle itself and a bunch of other experiments and they are teamed up with sendero justo the narco terrorists mm -hmm. not huge fans of the big wigs because the big wigs steal their shipments and raid them and plunder them as they go in and out of the forest and then another one of the factions is the mama pacha network so there's actually a couple of competing biological artificial intelligences in the forest. One of them is based on flora and mm. one of them is based on fauna. So they're distributed networks, one running through all of the plants in a fungal mycelia network that connects all of the flora of the entire jungle. And from that, there is an emergent AI, a distributed network of intelligence that runs through the trees and mycelium itself. That faction mostly just wants to spread beyond the jungle valley. It wants to grow and get escape the valley and, and spread spread outward and get smarter and bigger. Expand the network. That's the goal of that one. Uh, not evil, but not benevolent either. Really self-serving. Uh, 
another one of the factions is the Narcotics Trafficking Council, who obviously is at odds with Sendero Justo, and they are the main government power for the region. When it comes to the Dark Forest, they're tasked with, you know, doing carpet bombings of uh, napalm to, to stop the forest growing, taking out drug trafficking. Mm-hmm. Uh, they are the main government power when it comes to fighting all the narcotics and biotech and tra- illegal trafficking coming out of the dark forest. So they're party poopers for the people who are making a ton of profit on illicit biotech and drugs. Uh, but yeah, they're the main government power and they, they are the, you know, troops in power armor and SWAT teams and, you know, police raids. They have a huge amount of power in the city, not quite as much in the jungle itself because it's not their territory. But e- even with that, it's probably not a good idea to go against them um, head on because they still have more guns than you. They have more guns, exactly. They have big, big guns and a lot of government money. Because one of the other th- one of the things I was going to ask is, given given all the crazy shit in the forest, mm-hmm. um, what's st- what's stopping the forest from expanding? And it sounds like you already answered it. That when the forest tries to expand, they they approach it with um, carpet bombing. Yes, the the narcotics trafficking council they at the at the mountain range is where they've drawn the line. So it's a little bit easier to keep the jungle from expanding up uphill on the top of the mountains, but it still is expanding slowly. But yeah, they that is where they've drawn the line. They have allowed the jungle valley to completely proliferate with all the transgenic flora and fauna but they do not allow it to get over the peaks of the mountain. Mm-hmm. And then another one of the factions, the smaller one, is the Pishtakos. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with that mythological creature, the Pishtako. I think I, I, think I am, but th- but it's crowded in my head, I'll put it that they're way. They're kind of like a Peruvian flesh-eating vampire slash zombie. They're a, a, boogie, a Peruvian boogeyman mm-hmm. that eats flesh. And that has become a colloquial name for people who are infected with this particular virus they get from eating meat that has been improperly cooked. There's this certain this certain disease that they can get where these sarcocysts of parasites and pathogens inside the flesh of uh, uncooked meat can infect them. And once they get it, they become absolutely uh, enamored with eating raw flesh themselves. And one of the side benefits of that is if this disease doesn't kill you, when you eat something, you can incorporate perhaps positive things from the thing you're eating into your own DNA. And this is actually one of the character classes for this uh, book is uses this mechanic as well, where I actually got inspiration for this one way back. Fi- one of the early Final Fantasies for the Game Boy, mm. one of the classes was simply Monster. Mm. And instead of having a level system, they gain power by when you face an enemy, it would drop meat, and then you you could eat the meat and gain a bunch of new abilities based on how powerful the uh, monster was that you ate. And there'd be some randomness to it as well. But yeah, the, I, I, I love that mechanic so much, and I so rarely see it that I wanted to introduce something like that. So this is a, a band of bandits like the bigwigs where they mostly target wealth going in and out of Dark Forest to gain profit. But also there is a religious spiritual element to them. So they, the survivors of this disease have decided that they can achieve enlightenment through transhumanist grinding of their own genome towards perfection of the perfection of life. And they see the mutational effects of their own disease and the forest itself, the, the retroviruses of the forest that introduce new mutations as the holy sacrament. So mm-hmm. they are bandits, but they are also religious zealots who look to mutation, the mutations that the forest brings and the flesh they eat as uh, the gateway towards enlightenment. Mm-hmm. And that's the Pish tacos. And they are all, they're not necessarily cannibals, but uh, they love to eat raw flesh to gain genetic enlightenment. <laughs> They're not. They're not. They're not cannibals necessarily, but it's certainly on the menu. Yeah, it's on the menu. And hey, if 
I mean, can it be that wrong if it brings you closer to God? <laughs> that's what I'd say. That's what makes it worse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then I think I already mentioned the Sendero Justo. Those are the narco terrorists who, um, ideologically, they have their roots in wanting to see a true communist government uh, and overthrow the current Peruvian government and really all of the world's governments with their own version of communism. But, of course, like many of history's communists, it's not just communist ideology on its own. It carries with it a bunch of other baggage. In this case, a ton of capitalism, ironically, because they are major drug traffickers and traffickers of biotech. So they are at once wanting to install a communist government in Peru while uh, using incredible profits they make from selling drugs in order to do so. Their seat of power is the drugs they sell. And uh, their more ideological side wants to use all of the power they get from that wealth to mm. install a communist government. And while they have some sympathizers in the government proper, on a whole, they're viewed as terrorists by the government in the world. As they, as they should be. <laughs> as, as they should be. But yes, there are some true idealists in there as well. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of a mixed bag where... And then they do occasionally provide a, a ton of help to to the more impoverished people of the area. So kind of like a Robin Hood phenomenon going on where they are popular among certain, certain groups, but they are also not above going on uh, forming death squads and massacring entire villages for, <laughs> for not being down with the cause. <laughs> mm-hmm. Now, with that in, with that in mind... Mm-hmm. With, would you can would you consider? I, I I end up asking this question quite a bit to certain campaign settings. But would do you think do you suppose that something like Gene Funk could work as not necessarily a hex crawl, but something close? This is as close as a hex crawl the uh, that I've made so far. So there is going to be a hex map, and I do have uh yeah it, there is going to be a hex map for the the jungle valley itself. Mm-hmm. So part of the uh, part of the campaign is in Cusco and Mazuko which are cities uh the the big city is Cusco and then Mazuko is a more a smaller city but more close to the jungle valley. Mm-hmm. So there is a, a I would say up to a 4 or 5 session prelude in the urban settings preparing for the jungle, you know, cuz it's going to take a lot of prep and a lot of intelligence before actually heading in there. So it could, it depending on how much time the players want to spend outside the valley preparing, it could range from maybe at fastest, you know, one or two sessions to four or five sessions preparing. Mm-hmm. Now, on the thing, it also mentions some new cl- some new class archetypes. So, mm-hmm. obvious. I'm not going to ask you to go into detail with each with each of them, but just give me the skinny on on um, what archetypes are going to be added to the pile. Sure. Okay, so the the biohacker one is the pathogenist. So they are specialists of viruses and microbes, and I fit that's very thematic. Uh, you there, man? You cut out. Sorry about th- sorry about that, folks. Um, cat problems. Yeah, my cat stepped on the mic button. Okay, so the uh, the biohacker has an archetype called the pathogenist, which is a special specialist of viruses and microbes that inflict terrible disease. So they they can use their bonus action each round to activate one of a plethora of viruses that are within a three meter radius around them, and these viruses might do damage. They might cause debuffs they uh, can poison people they can slow people down so there's a variety of things that, that a player can choose to at a given at a, the start of their round which which viruses they want to activate in their little miasma of pathogens around mm-hmm. them so they would be more predisposed towards being a melee type class because they would want to be up close and personal to affect those around them mm-hmm the code hacker class archetype is the algorithmer. So they specialize in creating 
algorithms that are pre-scripted to make them especially good at certain types of actions and makes them much easier. Uh, similar to, I'm not sure if you've uh, ever played the game Root, the board game. I've dipped into it. There's one of the factions in there is if you choose to give up a little bit of uh, give up your your choice, you know, a little bit into the future for what you predict will happen and let an algorithm run things, you get huge benefits if you guess right. The thing, if the thing you want to do ends up paying off, it's it's huge. But you might guess wrong in the way that the context is going to be, and then it doesn't pay off as well. So the algorithmers can pre-script their actions for greater efficiency. And if that condition ends up arising, it's a lot of if then type mm -hmm. situations. And if, if the uh, if situation occurs, then their effects are, are greatly magnified. Mm -hmm. The uh, the crook is a fun one. It's called the chem head. So because this is a area where there's tons of narco-terrorism and they're trying to sell as much product as possible, they have done a lovely thing by infecting the groundwater of the local people with a virus that greatly enhances the receptivity of all drug receptors for any of the contraband drugs they're making. The crook chemheads are the ones who have uh, not overdosed and have actually flourished with this condition. So they get much more effects of any narcotics they take. They're essentially, uh, yeah, any drugs they take have much, much stronger effects on them. They're, they're super druggies in a good way. So any stims they take, any nootropics, they get way smarter, they get way faster depending on the drugs. So they're they're super drug users. Mm -hmm. uh, the engineer subclass is the Demiurge, and they have a colony of nanobots that they can manipulate into a variety of shapes. They can put it into armor, weapons, tools, things like that. So they're they're nanobot colony specialists. They have a, a certain pool of liquid metal that they can do whatever they want to with. And then the gunfighters subclass is the hunter. For obvious reasons, Dark Forest is going to favor a ranger type archetype. And this is the uh, the first ranger type archetype I've included in Gene Funk because it's a perfect setting for it. The other settings, it didn't really make sense to have a ranger type archetype, but this one mm -hmm. it does. The hard case Pishtako, I think I've already talked about that. The one who gets a variety of benefits based on the flesh that they consume. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then there is the Genjutsu Bujutsu Samurai, who I'm not sure how familiar you are with uh, ninja lore. In <laughs> if you're a ninja fan. Yeah, I was, I was able to put two and two together on that front. Yeah, okay. So they're able to cloud the minds of their enemies. That's their their art. They're mind hackers. Mm -hmm. Even though they're not the hacker class, they're they have a, a good a good bit of intuitive mind hacking to cloud the, the minds of their enemies. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, the suit is the raider. Uh I mean I need some 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 class to embody the Tomb Raider slash Indiana Jones slash treasure hunting motif. Mm -hmm. So that is the suit archetype. Yeah, and I, I can I can certainly get behind that. Now, when it comes now with that in, with that in mind, when it com when it comes to expanding the gen genetic enhancement table, is it is it just a means of um, include including these including the stuff from core alongside the stuff that's being added for Dark Forest? Yeah, and also actually also the stuff that was in um, Shadows of Korea. So mm -hmm. even though I had particular engineer genomes that had some new g genetic enhancements. I didn't actually have uh, general rules for months or custom made engineer to use those genetic enhancements. Mm -hmm. So this, uh, yeah, the new genetic enhancement table is much bigger. And, and that was one of the most common requests I had from players was expanding that because it's one of the things that makes the game unique is uh, just how freaky you can make your character by changing its genome. So I've heard a lot of requests want to make that larger, and it seemed like the perfect book to do that because uh, so much of it is focusing on um, altering the DNA of the players, especially if they don't have the right uh, preventative medicines in the jungle, for mm -hmm. better or worse. Yeah, I can I can certainly I can certainly get behind that. So. Now, with that with that in mind, I also saw that you have that there's going to be a handful of Merc contracts that are that okay. are going to be available. Um, mm -hmm. With those that 
would it be correct of me to say that you're aiming for a variety of encounter types with those? Instead of in, instead of just, say, smash and grab? Absolutely, yeah. There's, there is going to be smash and grabs, of course, but I'm going to have, you know, things like bodyguarding, uh, protect protect this property because some other group of mercs is coming to attack it. And it really does depend on, there's always going to be given choice. Mm -hmm. So often, um, the, just like in Shadows of Korea, sometimes there'll be two factions involved that both want something that are at odds with one another, and they get to choose which faction they want to side with. Uh, so they may be the aggressors, they may be the, the defenders. Mm-hmm. Uh, often there will be heists. The grabbing something, breaking into a place, hopefully subtly. But if not, hey, you better be prepared for a fight. Those that will also be a type. Well, no plan survives the first encounter, as the saying goes. That's right. And there, there's also contracts for one of the main ones that they will be asked to do is a, a very powerful person in government has a child who is uh, sick with one of the diseases that comes out of the dark forest and getting that cure will be a, uh, one of the big contracts that they can get. Mm -hmm. So with that, with all that, with all that in mind, uh, what are you shooting for as far as a page count for the book? Originally, well, originally it was going to be 50 pages, but then, then it got way bigger. Uh, I expect now it will be 210 to 220 pages. Which, if I have, which if I have my notes, hang on, let, let me, um, I'm going to, I'm going to grab the PDF I have for Shadows of, of Korea just for comparison's sake. Oh yeah, it was, I believe 187, but I'm, that's off the top of my head, but it was. Let's find out. Okay, Shadows of Korea, and yeah, something like that. Although I, th I think the I think the one that I haven't that I haven't I have on my hard drive I'm is possibly outdated. Oh, I'll, I got, I'll have to fix one, that later. One looks like one eighty nine is the page count for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank thanks for the thanks for bailing me out. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this this new one will be the second biggest one. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll certainly be looking forward to the, to that. Um, it looked it looked like on the di on the digital tokens thing that mm -hmm. um, if that if that stretch goal gets hit, that's going to be support for those who want to be playing this on virtual tabletops like Roll Twenty or Foundry. That's right. Yep. Yeah, I'm. Uh, you know, someone is very, who's very proficient at Foundry. I haven't uh, worked on it too much, but someone, out of the goodness of their own hearts, and because they uh, they're good at it and they're a fan of the game, they made a really sophisticated version of Gene Funk on Foundry that I find really impressive. I haven't actually played on it yet, but I've just played around with making characters and putting in battle maps and it looks very good his name is oh i better he didn't give me his real name because i think he wants to prefers to remain anonymous when it comes to that so i think i'll, I'll leave his his even his avatar name out for now but yeah you can look it up you can find the uh, gene funk on foundry and it's free you can mm -hmm. get that for free if you want the roll 20 module there's the Shadows of Creo one will come out probably in a month or two. And then a few months after that, I expect in the summer, the Dark Forest one will come out as well. And this mm -hmm. will be after the... I haven't made a formal announcement of it yet. And that's because there's still some bug fixing going on. But uh, there's a compendium online for Gene Funk on Rule 20 right now. And it has drag and drop functionality and all of the NPCs, uh, dragging class features, genetic enhancements onto the sheet. And that's up right now, but I haven't made an official launch of it yet publicly just because I want to make sure it's bug-free first and you know that'll, that should happen in the next couple of weeks. 
And then when that happens, yeah, I'll, I'll make an announcement that Gene Funk is on Roll20 now as a compendium. Mm-hmm. And I, I will certainly be looking forward to seeing all of that take all that take shape. But with all with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens around here. Hey, happy to. And it's actually great timing because I have a gaming session uh starting right away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And anytime you see fit to return to the temple, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. All right. Have a good one. Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>